a uh, little mix up with the computers and the PowerPoint and everything else and I got in the bus out there and I've got a nervous dog who left her nervousness all over the floor. Yeah, I will edit that out of the video that I'm making today. But it's good to be here. It's been a while since I've been with Southwest Radio at a conference. I appreciate them having me. appreciate them putting me on the air. I always have a good time with God's people. I always like to say I love God's people because we're the only people in the whole world who actually do believe in giants, dragons, and unicorns. <laughs> They're in the Bible. Amen? Amen? A Bible. By the way, did you bring one to a Bible prophecy conference? Amen. Do this. What about the rest of you? Was you okay? The Quran, man. Open your Quran. Ah, no, no, no. Uh, two places if you want to. Ephesians six. Turn there. While I quit shaking and sniffing and getting out of breath from having to run and everything. Ephesians six, and then put a little place there because we're going to be there for a minute. And uh, Daniel two, if you would. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about me, I'm not important. I am the token UFO guy that they bring to a um, very prestigious prophecy conference. Intellectual was the word Larry Spargimino used. So, intellectual. Daniel chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> up on the screen, does anybody recognize uh, who that guy is? Does anybody know... That, by the way, that was before PowerPoint. That's, he's doing a PowerPoint before PowerPoint. This is Kenneth Arnold. Kenneth Arnold was a, um, a pilot. He was a forest fire equipment salesman. And he was on his way back from a trip uh, in his plane. And he was flying around Mount Rainier and uh, up in Washington State because a plane had gone down somewhere in the Mount Rainier area. Nobody knew what happened to the plane. The pilot didn't report anything. They just knew it went down around in that area. So he thought on his way back home, he would fly around to see if he could find out where this plane was and report its location. <laughs> While he's flying around Mount Rainier, this is around 1947. While he's flying around Mount Rainier, he sees these nine flying objects that are outrunning him by at least 13, 1,600 miles an hour. He, get, he estimated their speed at about 1,800 miles an hour. Now, 1947, we didn't have anything that traveled that fast. And the uh, picture that you see up there is one that he had drawn. It's called a plan form ship. And it wasn't really the disc that everybody thought it was, because when he described what he saw and how they were flying, he said it looked like if you took a saucer and skipped it across the top of the water, that's the way these things were bouncing and moving around. In other words, their flight was abnormal, didn't look like airplanes. He thought maybe it was something that the government had developed since World War II and was keeping it top secret. And of course, when the press and newspapers heard the word saucer, and they put the word flying with it, and that's where we get the word flying saucer. Actually, that's not the first instance of a flying saucer sighting. Um, one of the earliest ones that comes to my mind, 1941, this was sort of in my backyard. I... Uh, Grew, I was born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, but I grew up in Festus, Missouri, which is right along the Mississippi River. And if you go straight south of Festus down I-55, you'll get to a town called Cape Girardeau. And in 1941, in Cape Girardeau, a minister was uh, awakened in the middle of the night. Uh, local fire department, police department called upon him. They said, we've had a crash of some kind of aircraft and we need you to come out to do last rites. So he goes, he follows the police out and he goes out to the middle of this field by the Mississippi River and he sees, he's looking for an airplane that's crashed but he doesn't see an airplane. He sees this large metallic disc that has crashed into this field 
and he's led over by a policeman and they uncover these three bodies that couldn't have been no more than three, four feet tall. He thought they were children at first and he was thinking, where's the adults? The more he looked at it, the more he realized these did not look human. And they said, these are the, this is what we found. So he performs last rites on these three dead bodies. Next thing he knows, there's a military guy standing there in front of him saying, you didn't see anything, you're not going to tell anybody, and if you do, it will be the last thing you'll ever do in this world. So for all of his life, he had to carry this with him. He did tell his wife, and his wife on her deathbed, he died first, and his wife on her deathbed, gathered, I don't know how many children she had around, and she conveyed this story to her children, and they believed her. So that was about 1941. So if you've heard of Roswell, New Mexico, and a crash ship and so on, Roswell was 1947. This happened in 1941. So something has been going on for quite a while. Let me just run through some pictures very quickly. Uh, the one on the upper left there of your screen, it's called the McMin McMinnville UFO. Uh, there was about three photographs taken of this flying saucer. The photographs and the negatives and everything have been examined by professionals. There's no fakery involved whatsoever. This is an actual ship up in the air, a circular ship. They took re three real good photographs of it. The one down on the bottom uh, was taken uh, by a guy by the name of Billy Meyer. He's a, a man from Switzerland. Now, Billy Meyer is an interesting character. I've never, not really talked about Billy Meyer much, but Billy Meyer, um, I'm somewhat skeptical of him, but one thing I know about Billy Meyer was that he went earlier in life and he traveled to India and lived in an ashram. And when you live in an ashram in India, you learn Hindu. And what you do is you learn how to pray to 330 million different gods. Now, what do you think those gods really are? Devils. That's exactly right. So this man spent a majority of his life praying to what we know from the Bible as devils or familiar spirits. He gets back to Switzerland. Now all of a sudden he's being contacted by these aliens, one of which later on in life he called Sinjaza. And it was a female entity. And she filled his mind, his head full of prophecies and wisdom from the cosmos and all and really what she was in my opinion was a familiar spirit she was a devil posing to this guy and he listened to her all her life and by the way he took a lot of pictures of UFOs some of them I think were faked but some of them I don't think were faked uh, two pictures here both have been verified no camera trickery involved I know there's a lot of pictures out there there's fakes out there and so on but these are all been verified UFOs. Um, the one on the upper left, that was recently taken by one of our Top Gun naval pilots. They were on patrol, they're chasing this thing up in the air. He pulls his camera phone out and snaps a picture of this UFO. Now, these guys are trained observers. They know what a Russian MiG looks like. They know what jets look like. They know what airplanes look like. They know what balloons look like. They know the star Venus. They know what everything that should be in the sky looks like. And when these guys come back and tell us that they saw something up there that doesn't match anything that we know is manufactured in this world, maybe we ought to believe them. Because a lot of the scientists and the physicists and the astronomers out there are saying, oh, that's a glitch, or he saw the planet Venus, or it was, that was one of those mylar balloons. And he's going, really? A mylar balloon can travel at 3,000 miles an hour and make right-hand turns without stopping? I don't think so. Uh, the one in the upper left again, that's called a TR-3B type UFO. That one's being seen quite a bit. In fact, in the St. Louis area, back in the early 2000s, the uh, St. Louis news stations ran a 30-minute uh, special on this. One of these traveled across the St. Louis area over into Illinois. There were several Illinois police departments that were called out 
to view one of these giant triangle shaped UFOs hovering slowly across the state of Illinois made absolutely no noise whatsoever, no propellers, no wings, no jet uh, trails coming out of it, no seemingly no form of machinery or motions or anything like that. It's just traveling. It was seen by probably about a hundred people and so on. But that one was seen, this particular one was seen in Belgium a few years ago. Here's another one I think by uh, Billy Meyer in Switzerland. Um, some of these are taken, they're taking pictures and they don't know that there's anything there when they take the picture. And then when they get to looking at it, they're going, there's something in that picture. They didn't know it was there before. Um, again, on the upper left hand corner, three of these or three or four of these triangle shaped UFOs. This was taken, it's a screen capture taken from an infrared camera on one of our Navy boats, United States Navy boats. For several nights consecutively, these UFOs came out and shadowed the movements of this American naval ship for several nights. All the sailors saw it, the captain saw it, they took infrared photos of it. This one was leaked out to a guy by the name of Jeremy Corbell who does uh, documentaries on UFOs, skinwalkers, things like that. And uh, this one has been verified that it is an, an authentic. This is part of the Pentagon's release of news and photographs and information that they've been coming out since 2017, 2018, when the New York Times ran their article about military encounters with UFOs and a program run by the Pentagon called ATIP which stands for Advanced Aerial Threat Identification Program. The word threat is in there because they are researching military accounts of UFOs seeing them as a potential threat to the defense of the United States of America. So. I was going to ask the question, do you believe in UFOs? The question itself now to me is irrelevant whether you believe in them or not. Your government does, the Pentagon does, the best people governing the defense of our nation believes in them. Now we live in an age where practically everybody is carrying a phone, with a camera and a video recording device in them and we're seeing more and more videos and pictures of strange lights, strange figures, flying things in the air, things that are doing uh, motions that none of our ships can do. In fact, they defy the laws of gravity. So whether you believe in them or not, to me, is irrelevant. They exist and I wouldn't be here if I couldn't show you from the Bible exactly what they are. So the question I want to ask you is, has anybody here ever seen a UFO? And I listen, I already know. I did this at a church one time. It's a church that I've gone to for years down in Arkansas. And I started out and I said, has anybody here ever seen a UFO? And boy, nobody raised their hand. And I got done with the presentation and I said, does anybody have any questions? And them hillbillies came out of the woodwork. Brother Mike, I saw some lights years ago. Boy, I tell you what, flew over my farm. And, and I'm going, why didn't you guys tell me at first you saw a UFO? Who has never seen a UFO? Raise your hand. Well, that's not true. I just showed you about 10 pictures of them. <laughs> I caught you on that one. That was my icebreaker for the day. 1947. The um, Army Air Base in Roswell gave permission to release this article saying that a flying disc, a saucer, had been discovered, a crash saucer had been discovered just outside, it wasn't in Roswell, it was uh, on a guy's farm about 30, 40 miles outside of Roswell. 
But they released the story that, yes, and it made headlines all over the country, all over the world. Army reveals it has a flying disc found on a ranch in New Mexico. Then word came down from Washington, D.C. Scrub the story. So the very next day, all of a sudden, they come out with these tattered pieces of a silvery weather balloon, tattered to pieces, saying... We didn't find a spaceship. There are no spaceships. There's no alien saucers. We don't have anything like that. There was no dead aliens found. This, it was a dummy that we had, and it's a secret program we didn't want to tell anybody about. But they lied through their teeth. And I, I can explain to you from the scriptures how I know they lied. I'll get to that in a little bit. UFOs have been seen throughout history, have been painted into artwork. Here's a painting of the Madonna. And the artist, whoever painted this, saw a glowing, brightly lit shield or disc in the air. And he painted himself, seeing the disc up in the air, painted himself into the background. Here is another one. It's supposed to be the, something that represents the glory of God shining down, but it looks like a silvery disc up in the air. This is an ancient cave painting. It looks exactly like... Many of the photographs we've seen, many of the eyewitness accounts we've seen of UFOs. Uh, here is another piece of artwork. You see a glowing disc here. Let's see if I can you can see my mouse up there. Uh, up here in the sky, shining down, giving illumination to whoever this is here in the painting. Here's another one. And what's interesting to me is this guy inside whatever this is, is actually he has his hands on controls. He's not just simply riding in there. He's got his hands manipulating whatever it is that's flying through the air. Here's another one all throughout history. Now, it used to be, and I've had, had this subject in my mind for years. Ever since I was a, a young boy in elementary school, I've been interested in UFOs, Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, all of those, the, I think you have the book back here, Marginal Ministry, uh, Mysteries. All of those things that everybody said doesn't exist, I've always wanted to know whether or not they've existed. I've been a Christian, I've been saved since I was nine years old. And so to me, it's always been in my mind that if they do exist, then God created them. Because I believe that Jesus Christ created all things and there was without him was not anything made that was made. Can I hear you say amen? amen? So if he made them, then he made them for a purpose. And if he has them made for a purpose, then that purpose is going to be found in the pages of our Bible. And it's up to us as God's people to do what? Study to show ourselves approved. If we are living in the days of the last days, and I believe that we are, amen? Of course, my grandfather did too. But we have to be getting closer and closer every day, right? So as we near the day of our Lord's approaching, we know that certain things in the scriptures are going to be opened up to us. Knowledge shall increase. People shall run to and fro, the book of Daniel says. So it used to be that if you wanted any kind of information from the news media about UFOs, you had to get it from the National Enquirer, the Weekly World News, all of those tabloid magazines at the supermarket. The New York Times wouldn't touch it until 2017. And they got in touch with a man by the name of Luis Elizondo, who used to run the ATIP program for the Pentagon. $22 million, and by the way, $22 million in Pentagon money is just a drop in the bucket. But $22 million spent studying, and the New York Times ran this article, and it made headlines all over the world. And what it's done, it's forced the United States government, specifically the Pentagon, to come out and actually reveal some of the information that they have. We know that they're not going to give it all to us. We know they're not going to tell us everything they know. We know that probably because of 
national secrets or national defense. There are things that they can't tell us. Luis Elizondo, I think he's a good guy. I think he's a good American. He's not saved, but I think he's a good American. And he said, look, if there was a way that I could tell just the American people what I know, I would do it instantly because I think the American people deserve to know it's their government. But he said, then you would have the North Koreans, the Russians, the Chinese and everybody else know what it is that we know and what it is that we have and what it is that we're experimenting with and so on. So I can't tell you. But he did give a speech here not too long ago and I watched it. And he said he now he joined a uh, company called To The Stars Academy. It was run by Tom DeLong. Does anybody know who Tom DeLong is? Good. You don't listen to rock and roll. Tom DeLong is a rock and roll star. He was with a group called Blink-182. Tom DeLong has had this lifelong fascination with UFOs. He is also a Freemason. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow night. And there is a connection. Amen. When I saw the square and compass on his guitar, I went, ah, I know why he's fascinated with it. The same spirit that is behind Freemasonry is the same evil spirit. It's the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air. And all the lost people in the world follow that spirit, don't they? Okay, so they're all on the same team, basically. But Tom DeLong started a company. He hired Luis Elizondo. He hired some people that were former CIA, which, by the way, you're never former CIA. You're CIA. So while Tom DeLong thinks these CIA guys are working for him, he's working for the CIA. But he starts this company that is going to investigate and start research on the technology behind these craft, specifically how it is they're able to move through the air, through the ocean, back into the air without anything slowing them down or stopping. I've got a video. I don't have it with me today, but I have it uh, on our website. It basically shows a UFO down in Puerto Rico at a um, United States uh, airstrip down there that went flying across the airstrip, it went down into the water and came back up, it never slowed down a bit. How is it that it defied those laws of physics? How is it that those ships can make right angle turns without either stopping and turning or veering around the way we have to? How is it they can go from being completely motionless to traveling at three, five, ten thousand miles an hour? One radar guy on the USS Nimitz um, carrier group that was part of this article, he's a radar operator, and he said that he spotted, their radar goes all the way up to 80,000 feet, and he said he spotted a fleet of these things that went from 80,000 feet down to sea level in less than a second. You can't fall that fast. We don't have anything that can fly that fast. David Fravor was one of those Top Gun pilots and they interviewed him multiple times. He said, when I saw it, he, they said, were you afraid? He said, no, I wanted to fly one. <laughs> I want to know. So they are investigating how they can do that, which would include then, this is going to sound weird, warp drive. Mm -hmm. The ability to take space and fold it so that let's say Earth is here and planet Zenith is over here and they're 100 million light years from each other. But there's a way you can fold space to bring them closer together. You know how the Bible says that God, when he came down, he bowed the heavens. The Bible talks about the heavens being like a mantle. And what did Elijah do with his mantle before he crossed the River Jordan? He folded it just like they say you fold space if you're going to travel from A to B. I think these things are in the Bible. But anyway, government admits it studies UFOs. So about those Area 51 conspiracy theories, there is one of the ships that they videoed from uh, several of our pilots. That was called the Gimbal. They said it was traveling at about 120 knots against the wind. And the wind had no effect on it whatsoever. Navy pilot describes 2004 encounter with UFO off San Diego coast. That was the gimbal one. 
uh, the one on the left was called, I think that one was called the, um, the Tic Tac UFO. Because it looked like a giant 40 foot long Tic Tac. That's the one that David Fravor uh, followed. Then, this came out three weeks ago. Uh, the Sun newspaper in the United Kingdom uh, kept going after the Pentagon under the, um, uh, what's it called, when the uh, Freedom of Information Act, thank you. When they keep trying to, they spent four years forcing the Pentagon to come out with more and more pictures, more and more uh, uh, evidence that the government has been investigating UFOs and the government, the Pentagon, releases 1,500 pages. Now, I found somebody that found these documents for me. I have them with me. I have not had a chance to read them yet or I'd be telling you about those. But anyway, recent articles that talk about the government and their knowledge of UFOs, their knowledge of the pilots that are with those UFOs and so on. And then this article showed up. Uh, this is Nick Pope. He was hired by the United Kingdom uh, back in the 90s. He was their X-Files guy. He was their UFO expert. He was hired by the Ministry of Defense to study and examine every British military encounter of UFOs and he was to collect and the secrets this guy knows has got to be amazing but Nick Pope said alien first contact could destroy religion now let me ask you this could it destroy yours if if it came out and was revealed that we're not the only ones in this great universe of gods. That there are other civilizations out there somewhere. And they are better than us and older than us. And the earth isn't really 6,000 years old the way we believe. And on and on and on. Would it destroy some people's Christianity? Yes. Absolutely. Chain yourself to your Bible, people. Read it. Study it. Anchor yourself to the word of God so that nothing, no wind of doctrine can blow you away. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, I don't know if I'll get into all of what he said, but I do have it on video. One of the first books I read was by Eric Von Daniken. Uh, go to Ezekiel, if you would. This was when I was in, I think, middle school, I was about sixth or seventh grade when I read Von Daniken's book. And it fascinated me. Von Daniken was, he grew up Roman Catholic, and he said um, he's uh, Danish or Swiss or something like that, and he said that he was taught about God and how God was supreme and how God was bigger and God created everything. But he said he's reading Ezekiel, and he said, obviously God here is riding on a chariot, and he said, if he's God, why does God need a chariot? So he quit believing in God because of that. And I, God had mercy enough on me, I was grounded enough in Sunday school and sitting in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meetings, amen? amen. That means bring your kids to church. Amen. They're going to need it more than you in the days that are coming. So I, God grounded me enough in this book and I'm reading it and he's saying that God is these UFO beings and when God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, that that's the aliens talking to their council. This is how we're going to make God. And I said, no, that's God speaking to God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. But let's look at Ezekiel one. I have it in my notes here. I'm getting ahead of myself. But if we just look at it, look at verses like. 15 and 16, now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like, so he's mentioning wheels here. And the wheels are by these four living creatures and they're holding up this firmament and on top of this firmament is a throne. And one like unto the son of man sitting on the throne and it's brightly lit and it's got lamps all over it. And of course, Von Daniken is looking at that and saying, that's a UFO. That's where he got deceived. Now. I can't answer for you the question why God needs a chariot. He doesn't. He's God. But I can't answer for you the question 
Why does God need me? He doesn't. But he chooses to use me and you and you because it's his creation. He created the angels in the heavens. He created all the stars. He created all the planets. He created the moon. He created us. He created all the beasts of the field. He created all the fish in the sea. Why wouldn't God use them for his pleasure and his enjoyment? So apparently God does ride a chariot. In fact, God's got more of them than you do. The Bible says in Psalm 68, 17, the chariots of God are 20,000. Not even Elon Musk has that many cars. Amen. <laughs> even thousands of what? So according to this verse, what are the chariots of God? Angels. angels. Isn't that weird? We think of angels like these flying things that look like men. Some look like dragons. Some look like this or that and the other. But apparently God has a living chariot. And is that so hard to understand in the days that we're living in right now? I mentioned Elon Musk. What is he trying to build? A car that doesn't need a driver. Because the car itself, using artificial intelligence, is smart enough to drive itself. I was talking to my insurance agent a couple years ago, and he said he attended a meeting of agents, and the topic was not if, but when the cars become completely autonomous. Meaning the cars are going we, listen, we are heading into an age where the computers are going to become self-aware. That's called artificial intelligence. Whether you believe it or not, we're almost there. Your phone is tapping into everything you say, do, think. This is why you can think something and go up to your computer to Google and all of a sudden Google's got it typed in for you. That's scary. But that's the day we're living in. And he said, in the days that the cars become autonomous and they have a wreck, who's paying for it? You're not the driver because you weren't driving the car. The car was driving itself. So who's going to pay for the accident that that car got into? Well, if they're smart enough, they won't have accidents. Amen. Yeah. But that was what he was thinking. So we live in a day now to where can we can we realistically see that in the next 10 years and it may not take that long that our cars will become intelligent enough that they we won't even have to push a button for them to come and pick us up they'll know when to come and pick us up and they'll know where to take us and they'll know how to get there in case traffic an hour from now gets clogged up somewhere that's also I passed a, a, an accident on Interstate 44 a few months ago and it had just happened and I looked at my Google Maps and Google Maps had already outlined that stretch of the highway in red no police no ambulance had shown up yet to the accident how did Google know that that accident had just happened how did they know because everybody else on the highway has a phone and it's tapped into every one of them and it noticed that all the cars started slow. We probably noticed that that guy that wrecked his car said, oh, blankety blank. And knew something was going on. And it already marked that part of the highway that there was a slowdown in traffic. That's nothing compared to what we're going to see. So God has at least 20,000 chariots and all of them are alive. They're living creatures. They're angels. Uh, Psalm 104. The Bible talks about the angels. They're spirits. They're of the spiritual realm. And what they're made of. They're made of flaming fire. In other words, they're made of light. They glow like light. They appear as light. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So in 2 Kings, 
The Bible says, when the servant of God, of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And a servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? You know this story. He answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they be, that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray that he open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. What were they? They were the angelic realm surrounding them, covering them so that no harm would come to Elisha and his servant. Somebody say that. That's the kind of stuff that if we could see. They're probably parked out in the parking lot guarding your car. Amen. Amen. They're probably in here right now. We just don't know it, but they are around us. Now, let me ask you a question. When the Lord sends his angels to gather together his elect, what are those angels going to be? What kind of angel picked up Elijah? Second Kings 2.11, it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire. How did Elijah go from earth to heaven? Chariot of fire and a horse is an angel. So when Jesus said he shall send his angels to gather together his elect, could he be sending those chariots? I hope so. I hope mine's at least got Bluetooth. <laughs> right? Isaiah 66, 15, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and his chariots like a whirlwind. So you can say, well, no, he went up in a whirlwind. Well, Isaiah 66, 15 says they're both the same thing. Some sort of energy and the chariots themselves are the angels of the Lord that I believe are going to come take us home one of these days. Certainly they're around us right now. Now let's look in Ezekiel 4. Let's get the, let's get the, the straight on this. How much time do I have? In the old days, when we did um, conferences for Southwest Radio, the greatest fear of any speaker was to see Noah Hutchings coming down the side of the aisle. That meant shut up. And we shut up. I miss him. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 4. And I looked and behold a whirlwind came out of the north. Study the north in your Bible. Study the north. Uh, Jeremiah mentioned multiple times about an army coming from the north. And he said the north country. Now. What's up at the North Pole? Is there any land? There's no land. Is there any cities up there? No. Is there any army that we know of up there? It's nothing. So what is the North talking about? Where did God come from in Ezekiel chapter 1? He came from the North. I think the North is a reference to the heavens. Study the word north, anything north in the Bible, see if you come up with the same thing. Behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud. See, there's the whirlwind. When we see the whirlwind, we're going to see the chariot. A fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof is the color of amber, out of the midst of fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Now, Brother Hutchings and I had one thing in common really good, and that is we love to study the numbers of the Bible. Study the numbers of the Bible like you would study the sayings of Jesus Christ. Study the numbers of the Bible like you would study doc the doctrine of Paul. Study the numbers of the Bible like you would study the prophecies of Isaiah, because they're there for a reason. God didn't just pick them out of thin air and use them. Why did he tell Naaman to dip in the river Jordan seven times? Why was the priest to sprinkle the blood seven times? Why was there 12 apostles? Why was there 12 tribes? Why are there four gospels? Why are there five of this? Why are there six of this? Why does the beast have six, six, six? Why does the giants have six fingers and six toes? Why was Goliath six cubits tall? I could go on all day long and talk about numbers. I've studied these numbers and what they meant. I used Hutch's book. I used uh, E.W. Bullinger's book. I did... Um, I studied um, 
uh, I can't remember a guy, 100 years ago wrote a book. But I studied those books and then I said, God, you show me from the Bible what these numbers mean. And we're going to study that. So out of the midst of the came four living creatures. This was their appearance and they had the likeness of a man, meaning they were humanoid. And as for the likeness of their faces in verse 10, they four, notice I have that underline, had the face of a man. They had the face of a lion on the right side. They four had the face, there's a number four again. Face of an ox. They four had the face of an eagle. There it is again. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another and two wings covered their bodies. How many wings did they have? Four. Ezekiel 1 is repeating this number. Four, 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 four. All through it for a reason. Verse 13, for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. When people see these UFOs, what is it that they notice? They're bright. They have lights. Boy, for things that don't want to land on the White House lawn and be seen by man, they sure are seen pretty clearly at night. Because they're full of lights and lamps and the appearance of lamps and it went up and down the living creatures and the fire was bright. People said that they saw a light that was brighter than any light that they could ever see. And the fire out of the fire went forth lightning and the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. You know what you just saw here? The movement of a UFO. Because just as lightning appears, moves and then comes back. People who say they saw these things said they were just standing still. They disappeared and they were a hundred miles away and then boom, they were right back again. They didn't accelerate. They didn't decelerate. They just moved and stopped. That's exactly what you're seeing in the book of Ezekiel. And you have to ask your question, why then is God putting all of this in the Bible for us? Remember what Paul said, these things are written for our learning and our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Read and study your Bible so you will not be carried away with the winds of false doctrine that are coming in the last days. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel. So now they have wheels upon the earth, the living creatures with his four faces. It was a four wheel drive chariot. Not going to get stuck in the snow, right? Four faces. And here again, they four had one likeness. And then the appearance was a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Think of these saucers that people have seen. A broad area, a round area on the outside, and then a rounded area usually in the middle, like a wheel in the midst of a wheel. And they went and they turned not when they went. These things that Ezekiel saw defied gravity. They defied the laws of physics. They were an absolute, he's like going, I can't believe what I'm seeing here. Verse 19, when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. And whithersoever the spirit was to go. Here it is. Think about this now. The spirit. Every one of us has a spirit, don't we? We have a spirit. We have a, a, the living part of us on the inside. So let's say that one of these days they invent the car that is able to tap in not to your brain, but to your spirit. Is it possible? Well, whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went, thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. And that's where I got the title for that video, Brother James. You thought I thought long and hard about this. As I was recording this particular video, it occurred to me that John saw the same thing in Revelation 4, right? But he didn't call them living creatures. He called them beasts. And I took the two things and I went in together while I'm talking in my mind and I'm going, oh, that's cool. The spirit of the beast was in the wheels. That's where that title came from. So now think of it. They're good spirits, good angels. Amen. Amen. Two thirds of them. By the way, think about this. God is so smart. He's way smarter than you. 
If I were to say, what's one third of nine? It took you a while, but you got it, right? Now, the Bible says the amount of angels is innumerable, meaning they're infinite. God is so smart that he can divide an infinite number into thirds. That's smart. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Bob Lazar, Robert Lazar, man that uh, got hired by EG&G, which is a government sourcing contractor, and said that he was sent... Before anybody ever heard of Area 51, he was sent to Area 51. And he, for the first week, had all these documents to read, and he's reading about UFOs and crash disks, and some were dug up by archaeologists, and he can't believe, he's going, I can't believe what I'm reading. And then he is shown one of nine saucers that the government had hid in a hangar inside the side of a mountain. And Bob Lazar said that the one that he worked on, called the Sport Model, said it didn't have a steering wheel, didn't have pedals, didn't have a rudder, a joystick, it didn't have a jet engine, it didn't have a computer console, it had nothing except a place where apparently the aliens would put their hands, and when they laid their hands there, that's how they steered the ship that they were in. What does that tell you? That the spirit of whatever evil entity, and I've got, how much time are you going to give me? Yes? The living creature was in the wheels. I got to hurry. Repeated use of the number. But let me teach you this. When I was writing the first book I did on numbers, which I, uh, Brother James said Southwest Radio is thinking about uh, reprinting those again. I'm glad of that. Uh, the first book, By Divine Order. The second book, called The King James Code. And they all deal with Bible numbers, what they mean. And I give all the scripture reasons why I believe. And I was looking at the number three. And I thought, well, there's three dimensions. You know, there's this way, there's this way, and there's this way. And I remember there was a verse in Ephesians that I thought talked about that. So I found the verse and I noticed that that may be able to comprehend with all saints. What is the breadth, length, depth? And I went, wait a minute. There's four dimensions, not three. Mathematically, they can prove a fourth dimension. Scientifically, physicists talk about the fourth dimension all day long. Say it has to do with time. And I believe it does. And I noticed that the fourth direction he called height. Let me ask you a question. Who can point to where heaven is? Just two of you? You're, the rest of you are not going? <laughs> Everybody do this. Okay. Now, if you're in Kenya, there's the Kenya flag there. We do a lot of ministry in Kenya. If you're in Kenya, which is on the other side of the world, and I ask the Kenyans, point to heaven. Are they going to point in the same direction as you? And are they going to point up? But it's in the same direction as you and I. So where is it? When you get... Who said the north? I like you. When you get out to space, where's up? Where's down? Where's sideways? It's all the same. But he mentions a fourth spatial dimension called height. The reason why the use of the number four in Ezekiel one was because these creatures that Ezekiel saw were not from here. They're from there, right? Okay, so now, Hutch, sit down. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And he saw not three kingdoms, four kingdoms. And the fourth kingdom, here's what I believe it is. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness. See, it tells you the word spiritual. Wickedness where? How high? All the way to the height of heaven. Okay? 
four groups of evil angels that we wrestle against. That number four is everywhere. So what is that fourth kingdom? Spirits, devils. And what are they going to do? What did Daniel say their big, and I want to do this tomorrow night, the big secret of Freemasonry? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And every UFO abductee that has ever told their story said, in every case, they took eggs out of a woman, seed out of a man, and they were constantly working on the hybridization of them and humans.